Okay. Uh, today, uh, uh, we'll spend most of the, the, the time in completing the proof of the, the famous Riemann mapping theorem, okay, which is a kind of exercise for us, uh, um, uh, which allows us to, to put together the results we have encountered in this course. More than a constructive proof, we have a, a, a proof in steps in which you apply several facts, okay? There are different proofs of the same theorem, but none of them can be considered, uh, it is, well, each of them can be considered actually a, an existence theorem more than a constructive one, okay? So, for, except for very small classes of of uh, domains in which uh, you can find explicitly the Riemann function, the pielomorphism with the unit disk. In general, what you know is that this function exists and, and it is well behaved, but nothing more, right? So let us start from this general fact. We are taking a domain D. and C, which is simply connected and different from C. So, uh, domain well contained in C and simply connected, which means that if you consider what is in the boundary of D, this is open, right? Domain means open, connected, simply connected. In this case, we are assuming that also simply connectedness, and different from C. So it is contained. So in the boundary, there are at least two points, right? So this this boundary contains at least two points. We call it we call them A and B, right? If you want, we can actually substitute this hypothesis for saying that, well, this is the case, right? At least two points are in the boundary, okay? If I remove one point from the complex plane, I don't have a simply connected domain, okay? Which, which point you take is not important from the, from the topological point of view because in any case, you are considering a non-simply connected domain. Hmm? Remember that we have defined simply connectedness in, terms, in geometric terms only for plane domains by saying that the complement in the Riemann sphere is connected, right? So the plane is in fact simply connected, but we don't want it. But the plane minus one point, so with the, the punched, uh, the, 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 the punctured uh, plane is not simply connected because in the complement you have infinite and the point, right? So two connected components. And we have seen last time that the, this hypothesis is crucial also for Runge theorem, right? In the approximation, right? Okay, good. So we have two points. Not in D, for sure. And we consider this function, which is one of the functions we'll, we'll, we'll use in this proof, which is the, the following. It's a square root of z minus a over z minus b. a and b are outside of it, and this is defined in D and takes values in C. Okay. What I'm saying is because A and B are not in D, this function is well defined. Are you with me? Yes. Why? Well, first, B, which appears here, is the only point where the function can have some problems in the, in the definition. And the second point is that here we are taking the square root of, in the, in the, in the, in the complex setting. So, this number cannot be zero. 
Remember that 0 is a branch point for any root, right? Because the definition of the, of the, the squares, so, sorry, of the, of the roots, is related to the definition of the logarithm. So when you are close to 0, there are problems. What we know, and I want to recall you that we proved this, that when you have a simply connected domain, and you have a function which is not vanishing in this simply connected domain, you can define the logarithm of this function, right? We proved this, right? So in particular, this function here, under the symbol of square root, is, non, is a non-vanishing, well-defined function in B, because it is not vanishing, and well-defined B is on the boundary of, and so that, that we can take a single-valued logarithm, well-defined, and this function turns out to be holomorphic in B. All right? So I summarize what we have done here. So z minus a over z minus b is well-defined in D and never vanishes. Okay, so that we have a function which is well-defined and not vanishing in a simply connected domain. We can take the logarithm Right? And therefore, we can equivalently define as a single valued function P of Z, which is the square root of Z minus A over Z minus B. Okay? Good. So no singularities, no vanishing of the function under the symbol of the square root, guarantee, and, and the fact that D is simply connected, remember that this is crucial, okay? Guarantees that you can define the logarithm, so the, okay, so in fact, there are several ways to, so several ways, there are several functions you can define and the proof, in one of the proofs is something like the, the logarithm or something else. I mean, in any case, the, 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 common, the common approach is that the function are, uh, the function which are defined are well defined and the, the fact that simply connected, that D is simply connected guarantees the existence of the logarithm and the, the, the singularities and the zeros are outside of the domain you are considering, okay? Good. Now, what I want to prove is that... So for the root square, you said, you want to make sure that this, uh, this P cannot be zero? No. For the root square? No, not in D. Not in D. Z belongs to D, and this number cannot be zero. Be zero. Cannot be zero. So, not, not, well, we have this property which which is valid in the real and also in the, this is zero if and only if z is zero, right? So the only possibility is z equal to a, but a is outside of d, so, right? Okay, so no branch point, no branch points, no singularities. And what is something we can prove now is the following, the function P of Z is injective, okay, as a function. And, and the, as a terminology in, in, in complex variables uh, and in function theory in particular, in all textbooks, these properties for holomorphic functions, which were, were also called regular functions, okay. In some textbooks you find regular. Uh, are summarized in this way, univalent, 
you can find many books with this terminology instead of injective and holomorphic. Well, this is just a matter of choices of terms, okay. Univalent means exactly this. It is one to one and regular or holomorphic as we are, okay. We have introduced this, uh, this class of functions. So, just in case you find in another book, this function is univalent. Oh, you can find all, even some books there, some famous books, recent books, univalent function, the theory of univalent functions, means which are holomorphic and injective, okay. And as I was telling you in, before starting, so the class of univalent function in some domains are very well studied and are related, for instance, to uh, problems like uh, the Bieberbach conjecture, right? So the functions which are considered are functions which are holomorphic in a unit disk, injective there, so they are univalent, and up to a normalization, you can assume that they fix the origin and have the derivative at 1 equal to 1. So the famous Bieberbach conjecture, and now it is a theorem, gives an sharp estimates of the coefficients of in the power expansion of zero of this class of function, injective and holomorphic, all right? Good. So, how do you prove that this function is injective? Well, you don't have to do very much, but say, assume that p of z1 is equal to p of z2. If you prove that this implies that z1 is equal to z2, then we are done, right? So, this is the classical proof. So this is nothing related to complex or not complex. This is because we are using the definition of functions, right? Okay. So, but the function is explicitly written here. So, we can apply and this number here is the property that it's square is the same, right? So, that you have that, well, this implies that And well, this implies that c1 equal to z2, right? Well, this is obvious, okay. This is a kind of very simple exercise. But let me also observe that assume that p of z1 is equal to alpha. Um, then it is not possible that the value minus alpha is, is taken by any z in d. Assume that alpha is a value taken by p at, at some z1, at, at only one z1, we can say this because the function is now injective, right? Take one value, call it alpha. Take the opposite of this value, this is not taken by any z. By, the, by, the, by n is in D, which means that, well, if you want to have a, this is alpha and this is minus alpha, this is zero, okay. Well, somehow P of D cannot intersect minus alpha, right? This is just to have an idea. Well, wh why? Well, <coughs> The reason is somehow related to what we have sh we have already shown for injectivity. Because if you assume that p of z1 is alpha, but there is a say z2 equal to minus alpha, right? So that you can have this uh, this. Uh, so I'm sa I'm saying this p z1 is alpha. And assume that there exist, by contradictions, there exist one z two such that p of in d such that p of z two is minus alpha. Then you have this, right? And then again, taking this the, the, the square of the, the 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 amounts we are considering and this equalities, we obtain that z one minus uh, a over z1 minus b is z2 minus a over z2 minus b, which implies that z1 is equal to z2, which is contradiction. 
All right? So same calculation shows us also this important fact. We can be also, we uh, also have that P of D is open. Okay, this is because P is holomorphic. All right, and P is not constant, right? So, the image of an open set is open. How can I say that P is not constant? Well, we prove that the P is in fact injective, so cannot be, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's even more, okay? <laughs> okay, so P of D is, con is open, right? And I can say that call D1 P of D, which is open, and take W naught in D1, right? Then what I, s I know that, well, I can find a small neighborhood of W naught contained in D1, which, which is in fact consequence of the fact that the D1 is open. Okay, so if Z0, if W0, sorry, is in D1, there exists a positive C such that this small neighborhood is contained in D1 because of the fact that W0 is a point in an open set. So a neighborhood, an open neighborhood is contained. But if I consider minus W0, right, and I consider this inequality, the set of all W in C such W minus minus W naught smaller than C, this is not contained in the one. Correct? And I can show you this, as I said before. This is W naught. This is a small neighborhood centered at W naught of radius C in the one. And here is minus W naught, and he, here is a small neighborhood, and the opposite. And we prove that the opposite of the values cannot be taken by any point, right? All right? And this is, this is nice because, well, when you have something which, in general, in this course, when you, you have to prove something, well, assume that the function is not vanishing. We have used it several times. It's not vanishing there. So you define immediately the function 1 over, okay? <laughs> and use this fact to obtain a contradiction. Now we are taking. Okay. I'm, I'm okay. We already know that the function is injective. Okay. And I'm assuming that P of Z1 is equal to alpha. Now, I want to say that there is no extra point in D such that any point in D, in the domain D, such that the value associated with this point is minus alpha. If you assume this, you obtain that Z1 is equal to Z2. And Z2 was, the, by contradiction, the point such that P of Z2 is equal to minus alpha, which means that Z1 is mapped by P into alpha and minus alpha. So it wouldn't be even a function, right? It is single valued. One point, one image. One, one value for the function P. So it cannot be that C1 is mapped into alpha and minus alpha, All right? And it cannot be, well, we might say, no, there is one point, one alpha. Alpha equal to zero is the only, right? If alpha is, it cannot be zero because as I said, P 
B of z is never zero. Pardon me, here? Yes. It means that z1 is equal to z2. This is the conclusion, right? If I'm assuming that this is, this is a contradiction true, then I'll tell that z1 is equal to z2, right? This is what? The p of z1 is alpha. p of z1 is also minus alpha. Right? And this is possible only if alpha is equal to minus alpha, because it is a function. But alpha is minus alpha only if, if and only if alpha is zero. But zero cannot be taken as a value. It's not in D and is not in P of D. Because the square root of z is zero if and only if z is zero. Right? So putting together all, all this stuff, you have univalent function and P of D does not intersect minus P of D. What, what do I mean with minus P of D? Pi minus P of D is nothing, okay? It's the opposite of any, of any P of D, of P element in P of D, right? Good. So I have that I can define now this. So I take a special Z no, W naught. This is... So I take W naught in D1, which is P of D. I use this notation. Um, I notice that this, sorry, that P of Z, okay, which was called W, is not vanishing when Z varies in D. And I put the same C in front, C in front, so in the numerator. And I call it F naught of Z. This function is well-defined and holomorphic in D. Why? Well, because P of Z plus W naught is never zero, as Z varies in D, right? Um, why this constant C appears here? Because I also know that, well, what I've done here is that W plus W naught, sorry, minor, smaller than C, is not contained in the one, right? So this guarantees the good definition when I assume that W is P of Z, okay, this number is never zero. Okay, furthermore, this is also true. It is normalized in such a way that this number cannot exceed C in the modules of this complex number so that this ratio cannot exceed one. So that I have a function f not finally from D into the closure of the unit disk. All right. So after these two or three steps, elementary steps, we have chosen from the domain D uh, a function well-defined, holomorphic, injective, as we'll see mapping the unit disk into the closure, the mapping, sorry, the domain D into the closure of the unit disk, okay? The function F0 is also injective. This is quite obvious, but let, let us go to, to the details of this. Well, you can see it either directly, you prove it, well, you assume that f of z0, z1 is equal to f of z2, and this is implies that z1 equal to z2, and invite you to verify it. You can write it explicitly, and using the fact that p is injective, you conclude almost immediately. 
But if you want to be more sophisticated and avoid calcul calculations, which is always the case, okay? <laughs> avoid calculations. Well, you can observe that that f naught of z is defined the following way: c over p of z plus w naught. And so that f of f naught is the composition of what? You have. Uh, of p of z and you add w naught right so you have a, a translation then you take an inversion and then you take a dilation oh this okay so let me write this t of w is w plus w naught I of W is 1 over W and D of W is C W, right? Take P of Z, apply, so compose T to P of D, you obtain P of Z plus W naught, right? Then apply the inversion, 1 over P of Z plus W naught, then apply the dilation, you obtain C over so you obtain, as I said, F naught. These functions here are the basic tools, okay, in, in, in what we have found in, in the Mabius transformation. These are linear fractional transformations. They are all invertible, so they are all injective. If P is injective and you are composing P with the injective function, the composed function is in fact injective, right? So finally we have an injective function from the simply connected domain D, which can be as odd as you want. So you have only one hypothesis added, that D is not the complex plane. Because otherwise, the functions of not would be immediately constant. An entire function, which is bounded, is constant, your real theorem. So you, there is no hope to find okay, a biomorphism from the complex plane and the unit disk. So in fact, we are considering a in inject an injective function in order to avoid constant functions. All right? So, um, and that's why I, uh, when, I, when, I, when I showed you why we were studying the automorphism of the unit disk, I said, well, the unit disk is in some sense the model of many bounded, so of any bounded simply connected Okay, so the, the, at the end of the story, we'll find that we'll find that the domain D, and this is the statement of the of the Riemann mapping theorem, is biomorphic to the unit disk. So at the time being, we have just one injective function from the domain D and to the closure of the unit disk. Okay. Um, and here comes the part of the steps which are less constructive. Up, up to now, you can say, well, we can do something, right? We can write, you can take A and B so, properly and then imagine that you can have something up to now. Yes, but now we consider the set of function which are like the F naught. holomorphic and injective, right? And as I said, this can be found to be also simply univalent, summarized with the, the term univalent. Okay, what well, is a matter of term? So this class of functions, so in principle, you might, might wonder if this class, if this, uh, this uh, family of function exists and is not empty, right? I'd say, well, I have no idea. D, D is just a simply connected domain, which is not C, right? That's the only hypothesis I have. Well, I showed that F naught belongs to this class. So it is not empty. So we're not talking about the empty set, which is always, the, always uh, a good hypothesis to have, right? 
Otherwise, you can prove many properties to the, uh, the <laughs> right? <laughs> the empty set is very good, okay, for many results. So, good. What can I say about this class of functions? This family of function turns out to be a family of function holomorphic and say uniformly bounded. They are all in modulus smaller or equal to one, right? Because they map the, the domain D holomorphically and injectively, so in a one to one way, into the closure of the unit disk. So the modulus of any F. Since you have this, then you can say that for any z and d, this is true, and for any f, right? So uniformly bounded. So maybe I put it on a new slide. I have that f is a family of uniformly bounded holomorphic functions, right? And by Montel theorem, This guarantees that the family F is also normal, right? That is to say, is a normal family, say. From any sequence of functions in F, you can extract a subsequence which converges, right? The point is that what we know from Weierstrass theorem is the function, the limit function turns out to be holomorphic because you are considering sequences of holomorphic functions. What we don't know is whether the function, the limit function is in F, is still in F or not. So we want to know if F is close with respect to this convergence. So this bounded as a family of functions, if it were closed, it would be somehow compact, right? And unfortunately, the answer is no, it is not the case. So what you have is that as an application of, as we will see, an application of the Hurwitz theorem we have proved so far, the limit function of an injective function of a sequence of injective functions is not necessarily injective. Okay, so let us collect the ideas up to now. So F is normal since it is uniformly bounded because we have Montel theorem, right? And this is okay. So which means that for any sequence in F, so we are taking a sequence of holomorphic and injective function from D into the closure of the unit disk, there exists a subsequence okay and there exists, okay, this is contained in here, right, so such that So, uniformly, I, I use G, okay? Sorry, I use G because then F will be used later, right? <laughs> so, there is a limit function which is obtained as a uniform limit, uniformly on compact set. By Weierstrass theorem, theorem, G is holomorphic and G maps the unit, sorry, the disk 
the, sorry, the domain D into the, into the closure. Right? This is what we know. The limit exists because of Montel theorem. Uniform, so the limit in, in the sense of uniform convergence on compact sets and the function, the limit function G is holomorphic. But I cannot say that G is in F in general because the additional request is that G has to be injective. I, I would say yes if G is injective. But is it true that from an injective class, an injective, sorry, sequence of holomorphic function, you obtain a limit which is an injective holomorphic function? The answer is no, unfortunately, as I anticipated. This is seven, right? So, equivalently. Is it true in general that the limit function of a sequence of injective holomorphic functions <coughs> is still a, an injective holomorphic function. So what we know is that the limit function is holomorphic by bias theorem, as I as I already told you. What I want to show you is that not necessarily this limit function turns out to be injective. In fact, consider well z not well z not and d, and consider the sequence g n of z to be f n of z minus f n of z not, right? So, we start for a sequence in F, okay, without passing through the subsequence, we already assume that this is convergent to a, a function, okay? Or if you want, you pass through the uh, subsequence and then you consider the directly the subsequence. And you construct a new sequence, Gn of z to be Fn of z minus Fn of z naught. Z naught is a point in D, right? This is, again, a sequence of holomorphic functions. This Gn of z is holomorphic, right? Fn of z is holomorphic. This is a constant term. So, okay, this is holomorphic. Um, what we know is g n of z naught is equal to zero, right? Now, I know that f n is a family, since f is, a no, is a normal, f n is a sequence which converges, as I said, to a function g, right? So I have passing to the limit, I obtain, well, this tends to G of Z naught, this tends to G of Z. And this tends to another function, H of Z, right? We have this equality. Now, what we have is that, well, the limit for f exists because f is the, the, the family f is normal, so we are taking up to a subsequence, a sequence of function in a normal class, in a normal family. So this function here by Weierstrass theorem is 
holomorphic as well. But what we know from Hurwitz's theorem is that this function is vanishing as in naught because we have a sequence of functions which vanishes at z naught for any n, right? Or it is identically zero. So if the second uh, uh, sorry, what I'm saying is that well, g when of z naught is equal to zero, but g n of z is not zero if z is different from z naught, right? Because f is supposed to be an injective function, right? So it vanishes only as z naught. But the limit function can be identically zero. If it is the case that h is identically zero, it is constant. And g of z, the limit function g is constant equal to g to g of z naught, right? So it is not injective. Because we have studied the zeros of limit functions, right? Using the argument principle, we have shown that the limit function can be either with the same zeros, also without zeros, or identically zero. So, if f of z is identically zero, equivalently, g of z is identically to g of z naught, so it is constant, then g is not injective. So this uh, fact shows you that you cannot take the limit of univalent functions and be in the class of univalent function for sure. There are some obstructions. In principle, you can have a function, the limit function, which is constant. You can make examples of this, right? Take 1 over n times z, you have a sequence, right, which tends to 0, for instance, right? <laughs> Okay, so now the idea is consider another class. This is seven, right? So consider f prime in f, and f prime is defined as follows. such that the derivative of f at c in modulus is greater or equal to f prime 0 of x c. c is n d. So you pick one point in the, in the domain d, you evaluate the function f naught we have constructed so far, not, not in, in c, but its derivative. See, take the, the modulus and say that well, what we are considering here is the set of all functions in F whose derivative at C have modulus greater or equal to this number F prime, the modulus of F prime zero at C. So, of course, F naught belongs to F prime. So, again, we are talking about a non-empty family. So f prime is not empty. What do we have? We have that f prime is normal since it is a subfamily of a normal family, right? <laughs> and is finally compact. So let me say what I mean. So, we have seen that the only risky situation is that the limit function might be constant. Right? Otherwise, it is injective, right? It vanishes only at z naught, right? No other, no other zeros, right? Good. All right. Um, so, assume uh, G prime 
well, sorry, the derivative, the, the limit function of a sequence of functions and f prime is constant. Then the derivative of a constant function is 0 and here we have something which is positive. Okay, so, you have a contradiction right. So, f naught as derivative c positive whose modulus is positive and cannot be right that the limit function has by continuity. This in fact depends on, on the fact that when you take f in f prime and you take this evaluate the derivative of f at c this function is continuous. In fact, well, how do you prove this? Okay. Um, in general, you have this. What we'll use it, in fact, is that. Well, this is but something very reasonable. If f tend to, well, this can be calculated using standard notation like this, right? Everything here is composition of continuous operations over over complex over complex um, valued and injective in particular holomorphic functions. So everything is continuous. So what we want to see here is that, well. We want to prove actually that this is something reasonable. You take the soup of f prime of c as f varies n f prime. I want to pro prove that this is in fact a max. Okay. So take f n a sequence. in f call this soup to be m right the soup always exists right <laughs> if it is taken for a value which belongs to the class f prime then this soup becomes a max right the soup always exists i take this as a but you take a continuous functional of something which is calculated starting from a normal family and you repeat the same argument where i'm going to show you and you see that it is equivalent. So, you have a soup, you can consider a sequence of value of a, a function in f prime such that the this number tends to m by definition of soup, right? But this function, this sequence of functions here are contained in a normal family. So you extract sub subsequence, make it converge, and the value, so the limit function f is such that this is true because of bias trust theorem again. Okay, so this limit exists by normality and this is true by Weierstrass theorem all right so normality guarantees the existence of the limit and the continuity of the modulus and the fact that the, the limit of the derivative of a sequence is uh, is equal to the derivative of the limit function. That is to say, one of the consequences of Weierstrass theorem guarantees that this is, in fact, true. And then, 
f prime is in fact compact, right? So modulus of f prime of c, the max prime, okay, is defined. Okay, in our in our setting, we can say that so for our purposes, we can say the following. So we are number ten. We can say there exists uh, f tilde and f prime such that the modulus of f tilde of f prime. So the derivative of f tilde at c is greater or equal to f prime of c for any f f prime. Correct. So there is this maximum. Yes. Now I want to prove that the following facts are true. So f tilde. Well, I don't know anything about this f tilde. Okay, I can only say that well, this f tilde exists uh, once again. Okay, but I can show you, and surprisingly, that this is true. That the function which is extremal for this problem take the maximum of the modulus of the derivative at c guarantees that this is true. And how can you prove it? Well, it is quite simple. We use what? Maybe Slon formation again. Assume that this is not. All right. And take this new function. which is the composition of f tilde with a suitable Mabius transformation, right? So if you want, the transformation I'm considering is this. The Mabius transformation I'm considering is OK? Here is a bar, right? It's conjugation. So if f of f tilde of c is not zero, this is a maybe transformation different from the identity. If it is zero, it is the identity. You said this, this vanish, this vanishes as well. And so, okay. But then I would have that when I have to calculate the derivative of f star, well, first, let me observe that this function here still belongs to f prime. Why? Well, <coughs> it is holomorphic in the simply connected domain D, takes values into the closed unit disk. Why? Because we are then applying a Mabius. The Mabius transformation maps the unit disk into itself and the boundary into itself. So no problem. It is injective, yes, it is, because it is a composition of a function which belongs to f prime with the Mavis transformation. And once again, the Mavis transformation is injective, so you are composing injective functions. And what do we have? Well, we have that this is the extrema function for this inequality. So, in particular, it is true that this is satisfied, right? So this is for any f, in particular, it is greater than the modulus of f prime of, uh, of f not prime, which is one of the functions in f prime, all right? So the f star I'm, I'm considering here is, should be, should be in, in, in f prime. But what do we have? Well, calculate, when we calculate the derivative of f star, at C, we obtain, well, what? Um, F tilde prime of C 
right? Uh, times one minus modulus of f of c squared, correct? And then one minus modulus of f of c squared, squared, and then minus what? The derivative of the denominator times times the numerator, right? But when it is evaluated at c, it is zero, right? So this cancel this. Are you with me? Good. And what I obtain from this very elementary calculation, we are applying the Leibniz rule, right? We obtain that the modulus of this f star I constructed of the modulus, sorry, of the, the derivative of f star at c is modulus of f tilde prime at c over 1 minus modulus of f tilde of c squared, which is, since this is smaller or equal to 1, this is greater or equal to modulus. And this is a contradiction because f star would be a function in f prime whose derivative at c is modulus greater or equal of the function which realizes the maximum of the modulus, right? So this is a contradiction. So it turns out that when you have a, the extremal problem solved, automatically you also know that that c is mapped by the extremal map into the origin, something mysterious. Okay, in geometry, this is the case. Okay. Good. Now, what is left to prove? We have an injective function from the unit disk, oh, sorry, again, from the, the simple connected domain D into the closure of the unit disk. Right? If we prove, and it is injective, if we prove that the function is also onto a unit disk, we are done. We have a bilomorphism from D, the simply connected domain, not uh, the plane, the entire plane, into the complex unit disk, right? So what is left to prove is, well, that F tilde here is also onto Which means that if I equivalently or for any alpha in D, the unit disk, so modulus of alpha is smaller than 1, uh, there exists a z in D such that f tilde of z is alpha. And I can say that this is unique because of injectivity, right? Well, uh, once again, assume not. such a z and d. And then we construct another class of another, another pair of, fa of functions and we show that we get a contradiction using the fact that f tilde is the extremal function from the problem of modulus of f prime of the derivative of uh, f prime is maximal. So this is so the first function I want to consider is the following. So if by contradiction f of z, f tilde of z is not alpha for any z in, for any z in d, take this function to be alpha minus f tilde of z over 1 minus, uh, sorry, 1 plus f tilde of z, right? Uh, 1 plus, so this, 
So it is a Mabius transformation up to a sign, right? <laughs> um, composed to so F tilde, composed to a Mabius transformation, then the square root of this. And this function is well defined, again, in single valued. Why? Because you see this by the hypothesis, by the uh, we are taking this as an hypothesis, so this never vanish, right? So there is no z and d such that phi of z is zero. So there are no branch points. And this never vanish as well, because alpha has modulus smaller than one. So it cannot be that this number is zero as well. So this function uh, phi is well defined. So is well defined. Holomorphic, and furthermore, we have that phi of z has modulus more or equal to one for any z, and d. and this is because once again we are considering phi t uh, f tilde to be a function from d into the unit disk, then we compose with them. Maybe so we will take the square root. So, okay, good. And phi is injective, right? Well, this can be proven directly because if you assume that so phi of z1, which is alpha minus f tilde z1 over. 1 plus alpha tilde alpha bar f tilde z1 is equal to phi of z2 alpha minus f tilde of z2 over 1 plus alpha bar f tilde of z2. Then again, taking the square, you obtain an equality of Mabius composed with the function f tilde, and f tilde is injective. So that this is equivalent to alpha minus f tilde z1 over 1 minus 1 plus alpha bar f tilde of z1 alpha f tilde of z2. Well, this is Mebius composed to f at the z1, Mebius, same Mebius composed to f tilde composed uh, at the z2. Mebius uh, and f tilde are both injective, then we conclude that this is possible only when z1 is equal to z2. Now, starting on phi, we construct another function. This is just somehow technical, but we require So we compose once again with a Mabius transformation. So we take phi, compose with another Mabius transformation, and we obtain psi. So psi has is holomorphic, well defined. Here there are no problems, it can vanish, there are no roots. Okay. What it is, is important that this denominator never vanishes. In fact, never vanishes because this number here is in the unit disk. And it is injective because it is the composition of Mebius and phi. Phi is injective, as I showed you. Okay. So psi is for free, say, in some sense, injective. It is for free. And I, have, I also have that since this is true, then psi of z is also such that modulus of psi of z is smaller or equal to 1. Right? This is also obvious. This is a composition with a notomorphism of the unit disk with a function which takes its values 
into the unit disk. So it's just a rotation, okay, in, into the unit disk or something, or transformation, good transformation, right? Good. So Psi is eventually in F prime. It is injective, holomorphic, well defined, and maps the disk, sorry, the domain D into the closure of the unit disk. So it is in what we have now that if we calculate the derivative of psi at C and take the modules, then we discover that by the assumption we have, that is, that F tilde of, X of Z is not alpha for any Z, then you obtain the Psi, which is defined using this hypothesis in several steps, right here, here, right? We apply this huh, to, have, to have a good definition. We obtain a function which has derivative at C whose modulus is greater than the modulus of the derivative of tilde C. And this is a contradiction. Well, how to calculate? Well, the derivative of C at C is once again the F prime at C times one minus modulus of V of C squared. And then I have minus, and then it is plus, right? Plus V tilde C times F prime of C times this evaluated at C, which is zero, as we did before. So the numerator going calculated at C is zero over one minus V of C squared squared. So once again, this cancel this. This is C prime of C. Now, what is this? Okay. I, rem I recall on this new slide, sorry. I recall in this new slide that we have these two functions. V of Z is square root of alpha minus F tilde of Z, one plus alpha bar F tilde of Z, right? And C of Z is V of Z minus V of C over one minus V of C bar V of Z. These are the two functions we are considering. That in order to define Psi, I need Phi. In order to define Phi, I have to know that F tilde of Z is never alpha. Okay, with this hypothesis, I can construct these two functions, and they are, turn out to be good. Saying injective, holomorphic, well defined, and mapping the, the domain D into the closure of the unit disk. And well, C prime of C is F prime of C over one. I calculated this minus square, right? That's what I calculated. So this is just what I have so far. Now, let us evaluate f of c. I want to, this is f of c, right? f of c is, well, square root of alpha minus, well, f tilde of c is zero. That's what we have proved, okay, just before considering the, the function phi and psi. So, well, f of x is square root of alpha. That's it. f prime of x is, well, f prime of x is 1 over 2 square root of f of x, right, times what? Times the derivative of this, right, evaluated x, which is minus f tilde prime of C, right, 1 plus modulus of alpha squared, because, no, sorry, uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, this has to be Calculated so the derivative of f prime is 
the, using the chain rule, the derivative of a compositional function, right? So 1 over 2, the function evaluated at c, which is correct. Then I have to evaluate the derivative of this function under the symbol of the root, right? Which is the derivative of the numerator at c, minus, because it is a minus in front, times the denominator evaluated at c, but f tilde of c is 0, so it is 1, right? And then I have the derivative of the denominator with a minus in front, so minus, and then I have alpha bar, f prime, f tilde prime of c, times this, evaluated at c, which is only alpha, because f of c is 0. So, if I'm not mistaken that much, <laughs> this is 1 over 2 square root of alpha times square root of, um, sorry, 1 over, 1 over, I'm sorry, uh, well, maybe, and then I have here 1 minus well, one min one plus this, the minus in front, and f till the prime of c. Is it? Pardon me. The minus is in front, right? Minus and minus. Well, the minus comes from, from the, the, the denominator, right? Is it? Yeah. So, minus alpha tilde times the derivative of f tilde x c times the numerator, which is alpha, right? And then f, f tilde of x c is 0, so we have this. So, minus is this. Good. Uh, so, I'm, 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 I'm wrong because this is not. Is it 1 over 2 f c, right? So, sorry. This is just a chain rule. This is uh, calculus 0, right? <laughs> no, I, I didn't want to make all the calculations. It's very boring, right? In any case, though, the idea is that I have to, to calculate the derivative of a, of a root of a composition of function. So, I calculate this and then I have 1 over 2 the function f of c evaluated at c, right? So I have that this number is here given and then I calculate the derivative of this composition of f tilde and the Mebius, a suitable Mebius, which gives us this. Is that correct or not? And more probably what I forgot to consider here is something else, right? No, it is correct. This is just the denom this is what? This is just the numerator, right? Of this expression. Because I want to show a contradiction by showing that f, uh, c prime of c has a modulus greater than f naught of uh, f tilde uh, prime of c. So to complete, this is this over one minus modulus of f of c squared, which is this. That is to say, this is let me say one over two square root of alpha, then a minus in front of 1 plus modulus of alpha squared times f tilde prime of c over 1 minus uh, modulus of alpha. There is, there is something which, yeah, which, is, uh, which I'm, I'm not convinced about. There should be a plus here somewhere, right? 
Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just. It's probably here the mistake, right? Here is the, that's what you pointed out. Out. So, with this, so what I have after this calculation should be that f c prime of c is one over two square root of alpha one minus modulus of alpha times minus what. Uh, minus 1 plus modulus of alpha square times f tilde prime of c. And this can be simplified in this notation uh, modulus of uh, alpha minus 1 times modulus of alpha plus 1 over 1 minus modulus of alpha, right. So, this cancel this and you have a minus in front. So, c prime of c is minus 1 over 2 square root of alpha. This cancel this, right? So, 1 plus modulus of alpha times f to the prime of c. And believe me or not, this cannot be because you have this, right? You can write this in this way. that take 1 minus 2 times this and then this right and this is greater well this is 2 modulus of alpha right that is to say that that the derivative of psi prime at c is greater than the derivative of f tilde prime at c and this is a contradiction. So, if you assume that a value alpha in the unit disk is not taken by the function f tilde, you can construct a function at psi which uh, has derivative at, f at, at c in modulus greater than f tilde which is the extremal function for this uh, for this calculation. So, we have finally the following. So, f tilde final 16 we have that f tilde must be on to and therefore, f tilde from d d is by holomorphism. What we do not have up to now is that well this by holomorphism which exists because we have shown that it cannot it can be constructed in some way as a limit function, but it can be obtained. Well, that f tilde is not unique and this is because well Remember that if we compose a uh, Möbius to f tilde, we obtain an, again transformation from the disk to from the domain into the disk, which is good with the good properties. For instance, if you take this function here, well, g tilde is a biohomorphism. of and you can also observe that the derivative is the same right in modulus at c. So, there is no contradiction the fact that there are some extremal functions not only one. So, it can be uniquely determined if you assume that for instance that derivative well what do you what do you uh, what is the effect of multiplying a e to i theta to to f? It sometimes tends to rotate, right? The values, and then the derivative is multiplied by a preferred direction e i theta. Hmm? Similarly, so if you 
if you, for instance, say, well, I want not just one biomorphism, but the biomorphism which maps xi into zero, right? So you decide that a certain point xi is mapping to zero, and then the derivative of xi of the function hmm, is, for instance, positive, in the sense that this is real and positive. It means that it has to be oriented in such a way that this product it turns out to be a real number, then you have just one possibility of choosing theta. There is no way to avoid this. So the general statement is, um, so this is the Riemann mapping theorem given a domain D simply connected in C and not C, there exists a biolomorphism F. Furthermore, the biholomorphism is unique if uh, we assume that f of we assume that the value, a certain value C is mapping to zero and the derivative of the biomorphism of C is positive. So it is a real number and positive. This depends essentially on the fact that you have the freedom of choosing a composition with an automorphism. The automorphism of the unit disk act, uh, acts uh, transitively, so you can move it to the origin. But then you have also the freedom of choosing a rotation. And if you require that the derivative at C is positive real number, then you fix the direction of the rotation and you have only one possibility, not, not the freedom of choosing whatever you want as a composition. As I said, this can be an instructive exercise to collect the ideas of several theorem statements we have uh, encountered in the course, but it's not constructive in the sense that you don't have a function. You know that the function exists, but in several cases, Okay, this is enough just to know that you can, well, for instance, if I give you a very odd simply connected domain, whatever I like, so for instance, well, okay, this is the contour of a simply connected domain in the plane. I have no idea of what are the functions which are holomorphic in this domain to itself. But I can say, well, I can perfectly describe the automorphism. Well, there is a function which maps everything into the unit disk. I'll call it raw, okay, by Riemann, okay, raw. I compose and then I come back. Take W here, move it here, take a, a Mabius transformation which I know characterize, so a maybe transformation is, is an automorphism. It's, or any automorphism, or holomorphic automorphism of the, the unit disk is in fact a maybe transformation, then come back and I define a function, which is an automorphism, which is invertible in this odd domain D, using this raw. So in some sense, this conjugates everything to the disk. And that's why I said that the disk is the model which has to be studied instead of considering all other simply connected domains. But in some cases, other models are much better, and in some cases, you can explicitly have the Riemann function. So the, the, the biolomorphism is also called the Riemann function because of the Riemann mapping theorem. So this is, in fact, an instructive example, and it is related to one of the exercises I gave you for, for, the, for the next assignment. And it is the following, assume that you consider as a domain D, the half plane 
the south plane. The right half plane as it is normally considered. So, this is a simply connected domain right and it is not a plane. It is unbounded but does not really mean anything because you just want to know that it is not the plane. And well, I invite you to verify that this function here, which is uh, holomorphic and D, as such that, oh sorry, I put a Q, but I wanted to use Z, right? That's why, because I'm, I'm working with <laughs> quaternion sometimes, so, sorry. Z, okay. This is holomorphic in D. Well, in fact, it is well defined in D. D is the open unit disk, so the only problem is that this function is, in fact, a meromorphic function in the plane and has a pole of order one at one, but one is on the boundary of the unit disk, so it is well defined. And well, we can also write the power expansion, right? because modulus of z is smaller than 1, right? So, it is holomorphic. That, that, that shows you that the function is definitely holomorphic, well defined. And it is also injective. And this is readily seen as I take 1 plus z over 1 minus z1 is equal to 1 plus z2 over 1 minus z2, right? And the, this is if and only if z1 is equal to z2. <coughs> so, it is injective, it is holomorphic and in the last few minutes, let me just say that if you prove this, right? That this number is positive as you can easily see. In. So, this is one half, then I multiply and then I have 1 plus z minus order z square minus z bar, then I have plus 1 plus z bar minus z and then I have minus modulus z square, right? And then I have 1 minus z modulus square. So, z cancel this z, z bar cancel this, this z bar and then have 2 minus 2 modulus of z square, right? Over 2. So, it is 1 minus modulus z squared over which is positive is z is in the unit disk. So, what we have is that this function here maps the unit disk holomorphically into the half plane. What you are asked to prove and that that is part of your exercise, probably you have the upper half plane, right? Instead of the right half plane, but it's just a matter of rotating uh, of uh, rotating the half planes. Well, what is not difficult to see is that well, you can always find a z which solves this equation when w belongs to H plus. That is to say, the function is also surjective, uh, is on to. So, it is the bilomorphism. So this is a, one of the few cases. This function is called the Cayley transformation. And uh, so, the half plane is another model of the unit disk. And it has, it has been heavily studied for several reasons. So, let me just give you one motivation. We have studied the automorphism in unit disk and as I said from this we can in principle obtain the information of, of the automorphism of any simply connected domain different from the plane because when you use this conjugation and you study everything there. In this case we have ex an explicit, uh, Riemann, this is one of the few cases, an explicit and reasonable Riemann mapping. Right? Um, and the half plane we have considered, so the H plus here, we can see quite easily 
what are the automorphism without fixed points, for instance. If you remember, when counting the fixed points of the automorphism of the unit disk, we have shown that either the fixed points are one inside and one outside, or both are on the boundary. They can coincide, but can be also different, right? And the unit disk, this is not easy to see. It is easy to see when it has one fixed point. So it's essentially, you have the subgroup, which is the isotropy group of the origin, right? The rotations. This is the model, right? Do you move the fixed point to the origin and say, oh, OK, this is nothing but, well, by Schwarz lemma, EI theta times Z, right? Rotation, good. But if I ask you, well, can you please show me an explicit example of an automorphism without fixed points and with uh, only one fixed point so coincident with the other at the boundary? This is called the parabolic case. Well, this is somehow hard. Or if you uh, ask you, well, no, well, let us start with the easy case, two fixed points on the boundary. Well, you have to somehow struggle a little bit to write a function which maps the unit disk into itself. It is injective with two points which are fixed on the boundary. Here it is much easier. And I show why. Well, you take Z, well, take W, okay, in the half plane, in the right half plane, and map it into lambda W with lambda a real number, uh, well, then it different from zero. Well, this is an automorphism, as you can see, right? You can invert it, and you're still in the half plane, right? It maps the real axis into itself, zero into zero, so it is, this is the boundary. You have to imagine that the boundary of the, the unit disk is now the vertical line, the vertical uh, y-axis, including infinite, which is associated with the point one, right? And this correspondence. So zero is a point on the boundary. The other point, which is mapped into itself, is the point at infinity, exactly. And you can see that if lambda is greater than one, then one point is how you say, attractive, and the other is repelling. Let's take the, well, you study this in dynamics, okay? One, well, if lambda is greater than one, you take the, 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 the orbits of any point, points tend to go to infinite. If lambda is smaller than one, well, of course, the opposite tends to go to the origin. If lambda is equal to one, well, this is the identity, everything is fixed, okay? <laughs> no dynamics, nothing interesting. Another example is the following. Take W plus I, which means that you start from a point and you move along the vertical line. This is, this is nothing but a translation, right, in the plane. In the half plane, it is an automorphism. Of course, you can take 2I or something like that, but with an imaginary translation, um, contribution on the translation, only imaginary. So that this function maps the half plane into itself, it is invertible, as you can easily see. Well, this function has no fixed points on the boundary except the point at infinity, which is the only fixed point in this case. And this can be another, so, another surrogate model <laughs> in case you don't like the unit disk. What is difficult here is to describe the case with a fixed point. <laughs> so there is a balance. So if you want to say the fixed point case automorphism, description is much better in, in the unit disk, whereas, and so, uh, I, oh, I ran out of my time. So, uh, so the, the theorem tells you that you can use disk or half plane if you like more as the model for any simply connected domain, different from the domain plane. But for the, for the plane, we have the description of automorphism. So in some sense, we cover all simply connected cases, right? And that's all for today. Thank you.